Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy, and I'm extremely excited about having you here with us today, being back in your eardrums to talk all about best practice behavior management for what is set to be another amazing episode. I can't wait to dive in and learn all about today's guest and their learning odyssey. If you haven't checked the past episodes out yet, then make sure to head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and you can listen to them all there or you can also find them on iTunes and Slash or on Stitcher. There is definitely something there for absolutely everyone as well as some sensational up and coming episodes planned over the next wee while. Just before we do get started though, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone that tunes in and listens to this podcast on a regular basis. Or maybe you're joining us for the first time ever. The show is so much fun to make and I get really inspired thinking about all the people that have benefited from all the wisdom our podcast guests share. Today's episode is of course going to be no exception to this and if you do like today's episode, then please share it as far and as wide as you possibly can. I appreciate that a lot of you are listening to these episodes from apps on your mobile devices and social smartphones and there's actually something that you can do that's really simple and would be really appreciated. If you go to the title of the episode, around there you should find three little dots and if you tap on this it'll open up a menu and one option in that menu is share. So via this method you can easily share it on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever social media network you use. I would be extremely grateful if you could take a couple of seconds to do that. But we will get started on today's episode where I have the pleasure of talking to Mark Kingston Jones. Mark has been involved in the animal welfare field since 2004. He is a workshop coordinator and level one instructor for the shape of enrichment and co founder of Team Building with Bite. In addition to running over 30 of his own student environmental enrichment courses in the UK, he has been an instructor on 20 SHAPE workshops and two others in the UK, USA, Indonesia, South Africa, Romania, Russia, Lithuania, Uganda, Vietnam, Singapore, Armenia, India and Croatia. Previous to becoming self-employed in 2014, he worked at Howlett's and Port Lim Wild Animal Park as Head of Education and Research. In addition to organizing talks, workshops, and conferences, he has organized over 100 enrichment team building workshops, as well as working with keepers to design and implement enrichment ideas. Mark is the SHAPE UK and Ireland Events Coordinator, Events Co-Coordinator, an Honorary Research Fellow at the University of Kent, and a trustee for Lakeview Monkey Sanctuary. He has been an author slash co-author on 13 publications and presented 47 talks at conferences both nationally and internationally. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Mark to the show today. Mark, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. I just realized how long that bio was. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's medium length, I would say, compared to all the other podcasts. So yeah, fair enough. <laughs> it sounds long when you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> hey, before we do get started, Mark, just want to express gratitude and thanks to you, you know, for coming on the show today. We really appreciate you taking the time. No, I really appreciate you having me. Thank you. It's an honor. We will dive straight into the first question today. Mark, could you please take us back to the start of your learning odyssey, where you first started learning about enrichment and some of the first enrichment projects you were ever involved in? Because am I right, you went from studying psychology to moving into the enrichment field? Yes, it was a bit of a bit of a twisted journey. It was one of those things where um, life didn't quite go to plan, but that actually worked out quite well. So I ended up taking a, a gap year before I went to university. And up until that point, I'd always wanted to work with animals, but kind of assumed that I'd never get the opportunity because I hadn't got a biology background. So I, I went for the psychology line instead. Um, but when I was on my gap year, I went out to Africa for uh, a few months and I managed to get some pretty cool animal experiences. Although it's one of those things now where you look back on some of those animal experiences as a naive 18 year old, they seemed pretty cool. And now I'm like, mm, I shouldn't really have done that. But nonetheless, they did rekindle that idea that actually I could work with animals. And so when I went to Stirling Uni to study psychology, I actually, in my first year, was able to hook up with some pretty amazing um, people in the department, Professor Hannah Buchanan-Smith 
Smith was the, the the main person who kind of took me under her wing, and um, she set me up with one of her PhD students as a research uh, assistant for for them. So my first year at uni during the summer, I actually spent a couple of months at Edinburgh Zoo, um, looking at the behaviour of the the tigers and the polar bear um, there. And if anyone's ever been to Edinburgh, it's on a quite a steep slope, so it was the fittest I've ever been in my life as well, because I was bouncing up and down the hill between the two enclosures, which was uh, interesting. But that kind of got me on a journey where I, I loved collecting the data and I loved spending, you know, just having that excuse to stand and watch the animals. And so for my second summer after uni, at uni, I um, I actually sort of developed an idea, which uh, everybody around me sort of thought was a little bit insane, but basically to create a remote control car that uh, was fit for running with big cats um, as an alternative to live prey. So actually, while I was in Africa, I'd worked with a guy who was a product designer and uh, he and I basically set about designing this little robot that would survive an onslaught from a lion. Uh, so I conducted deep research on that during my second year and then that led me on to my dissertation year the year after and and from there it was history basically. I sort of that was my the lion rover was my in to the the animal world and where I got hooked basically. That's a cool story and a couple of things I want to just build upon from what you just said because there's a lot of people that are listening to this podcast who are similar to a young Mark in Africa and <laughs> super keen to get some experience and not quite knowing how or what they're going to do and you mentioned that looking back you might have chosen differently <laughs> with regards to some of your experiences what what advice might you have to someone who is at that stage of their journey because I was having this conversation with someone the other day this is why I'm asking because I, I know it's relevant for a significant amount of people how do you choose where to go to get your volunteer work when you're just so keen to get volunteer work do you think it's important or do you think people should just jump into whatever I, def- I definitely don't think people should just jump into it and yeah it's a question we get a lot as well especially doing like the student courses obviously we get a lot of people who are, are looking for their in to the animal world and there's so much competition out there but yeah I, I think um it is important for people to be to be selective about what it is that they're the experiences they're getting from my own experience i was just traveling around africa and i picked up a leaflet about a, a lion breeding park and so i thought well, that sounds amazing I'm, i must go and uh, i went there as a guest and then i basically said can i stay and volunteer and at that point they just said yes so I ended up staying for a couple of weeks and hand rearing a couple of baby lions and didn't think anything of it at all until I then left the place and did a bit more research. And it, it turned out it might not have been as as wonderful a, a utopia of lion breeding as, as it might appear. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of places out there that are quite happy to take people's money. And obviously nowadays to do that kind of experience, you probably pay a couple of thousand pounds. Uh, I was lucky that I was I didn't have to pay anything and I did it for free. I think some of those experiences can be quite negative on people, give people the wrong idea. I have met some keepers who've, you know, who've done those amazing experiences overseas where they've hand reared hippos or wrestled venomous snakes and then they come back to the UK and then think they get a keeper job and think oh yeah we can we can do that now we're, we're qualified and health and safety rules and common sense say that actually those are not the right things to be doing in a in a, in a paid professional job so I think some of those experiences can set people up with the wrong ideas as well so it's definitely worth kind of looking out for for more reputable places and places that are going to give you a decent experience. I've also had quite a few people who've kind of come back and said, I basically sat on a beach for three weeks and occasionally some elephants walked past or something. And, you know, if you spent all that money and you really are genuinely wanting to make a difference, that's kind of quite a depressing thing to have happened to you. There are some places I'm aware of. I think there's um, conservationfinder.com. Um, I know it was set up by a keeper from SeaWorld. And, and the idea behind that is all of all of the places on there are places that people have actually been to and they should be reputable places. So that might, might be somewhere for people to have a look. Yeah, that- that, that would be very beneficial, I think. Yeah, it's hard, isn't it? Because someone in that position is just like, well, I just want to get my foot in the door. Uh, and, and you get like an okay and you're like, I'll just take it. Um, but what, what you're saying is that that could potentially actually be detrimental. I'm going to ask some challenging questions now then. Do, do you think you'd be where you are if you didn't take that opportunity? No. I, if I'm completely honest, as much as I now look back at that experience and go, I really shouldn't have been doing that. The only reason that I started doing the Lion Rover stuff is because I had those experiences playing with baby lion cubs in Africa when I was a naive naive 18 year old so as difficult it is for me to accept that that's kind of what set me on my welfare journey and as ironic as that is yeah I think part of it though again just to kind of come back to not just taking any old opportunity is because I did realize after I came back what it was I'd just been through or what I might have been through I guess is is a better way of saying it because I never actually found any direct evidence although I did do quite a lot of digging but it was the fact I didn't come back and shout and scream about the fact that I'd been squeezing baby lions and that I wanted to do that for the rest of my life it was that 
I'd had this this experience. I'd learned a lot from this experience, and it set me on that path. So I still think it's worth being careful about the experiences you can get. And that's certainly the advice I'd give to anybody you know aspiring to to go into this field is really just be as picky as you can be. Obviously, you know, you can't be completely picky because you know opportunities are limited. But just to choose carefully on what what path you want to go on. Yeah, and I guess visiting that website you just mentioned is one way. You're always welcome to reach out to me at Animal Training Academy. You can visit the website, go to contact page and people like mark and other podcast guests i'm sure as well are willing to lend advice where and when they can yeah so when, when you're at edinburgh zoo you're you're working with polar bears and what was the other animal you said uh the amur tigers so i was looking at the visitor impact basically for uh, alexandra farron's phd research yeah basically i was just looking at their behavior and and monitoring that in relation to visitor numbers and noise levels around the zoo yeah it was just as a again as a, a kind of first year out of uni it was quite a an eye-opener for me about what was possible and and the path that I really wanted to go down so and I'm a carnival guy at the heart so those two species as the first kind of study species was pretty cool for me as well and so you spent a lot of your early time just observing that first summer yeah literally was just it, I don't even think anybody really knew I was there I was literally just standing outside the enclosure for 20 minutes at a time and diving backwards and forwards but just literally just observing and then obviously in my second year that was when I got to do a lot more hands-on stuff when Blair Drummond's land week to test this remote control vehicle with their big cats which was a pretty big leap of faith for them and I'm very grateful that they allowed me to do it I'm going to talk about that in depth today just want to stay on this topic for just a little bit because we're talking about people at the start of their journeys and, and how they can get started your story and then your first experiences or your second experience I should say at Edinburgh Zoo just observing it uh ones that mirror other podcast guests and so potentially that's a, a tidbit we could offer people as well what do you think Mark that seek out opportunities that allow you to just spend a bit of time observing rather than getting your hands dirty right from the start so you can kind of see how things work I'm not sure if that's valuable or not what do you think no definitely I think um I mean that really was my first experiences of of a zoo really I mean obviously I'd been as a visitor previous to that but again you know I was a sort of a a young undergrad and kind of wet behind the ears and to me this was just the most amazing experience to just I mean, you know I'm a bit of a geek quite happy to admit that we but yeah that. just we just that. having that opportunity to legitimately stand and with clipboard in hand and take some data on on animals and the, again carnivores so not doing very much out of sight and resting was, was my highest uh, tab on everyone but no I think I think that is important it is it's not Again, it's kind of a lot of people want to do the really kind of energetic and, as I say, wrestling venomous snakes and, you know, hand rearing baby animals and stuff. But actually, the far more valuable lesson, I think, is actually just having the patience to stand and watch and, and take in a lot of information before you then kind of process that and how you want to how you want to use it. Mm, I like that. And just before we move on to the next question. Uh, you mentioned your Lion Rover and want to talk about that a little bit later in the podcast. But one thing you mentioned about the Lion Rover was the fact that your friends or your peers or people you talked to thought it was a crazy idea. But I personally love crazy ideas. <laughs> can you can you speak to, to how you move through that with, with that feedback you're getting and the value of pursuing crazy ideas? I've spent my entire career pursuing crazy ideas, to be fair. <laughs> um, I, you know, just because just it hasn't been done before. And to be fair, there again, as I sort of have progressed through my career, there have been other people that have tried various sort of iterations of the idea. But yeah, certainly as, again, as an undergrad with, I pretty much had no budget. I just spent my own like earnings on on doing it. And and the guy I was working with was a genius. He basically managed to turn two B&Q value drills into a working remote control car for about 250 pounds which was pretty incredible and again everybody assumes that the reason the first one didn't work was because we put it in and it just got trashed by the cats but actually it survived the lions very well um it just was the motors weren't quite up to the job so we've persisted with that crazy idea we're we're on version three currently which is sat in my garage and has been inactive for several years mainly because i don't have the finances to take it forward but i have a plan for version four so yeah this this crazy idea is probably going to follow me to the grave but i'm going to keep persisting with it and i think um yeah i think there's nothing wrong with with chasing a crazy idea i think that's something that should be applauded hopefully as long as the crazy idea is not too you know within within reason but hopefully a remote control car for big cats is fairly harmless as long as it works <laughs> yeah guys don't take this as a uh permission to do anything <laughs> you want um but yeah. that, the, the point is sometimes those crazy ideas that sound a little bit ridiculous are actually the ones that are worth pursuing and turn into something like a lion rover definitely i think you know if, if everyone sort of says well i always say if if it was easy then people would have done it already by now but 
with a little bit of uh, especially the way modern technology and stuff's catching up with us then i think there's more and more options out there and and some more crazy ideas like that i think would be a good thing for the for the zoo world maybe mm. and we we were planning on talking about this a little bit later but it just makes sense because we're talking about it now just to talk about it now <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so pe- people listening might be going okay great so they're, they're trying to get this picture in their mind right now of what the heck we're talking about with this lion rover Let, let's dive deep into this thing what is it tell people what it is what it, what it looks like so they can imagine it and and maybe share some more of your journey of creating it implementing and collecting data about it well so basically it was as i say the, the the very first one was the smallest and and i think actually still probably one of the most successful um it only weighed about 15 kilograms as i say the the internal components was just two b and q value drills that had been set up to run a, a skid steering system and we just had a, a little aluminium shell encasing all of that but yeah it was enough to give us a, a remote control vehicle that we would drive in with the lions at Blair Drummond and give them an opportunity to to show some some hunting behavior some active hunting behavior so at the time they had a pride of about 20 individuals and we collected data uh, on their interactions with it while it was in use and actually to be honest that wasn't very exciting you know they did what big cats do you know they poured it they bit it they they played with it a bit and then they all settled around it actually in a nice kind of mimic of it's one of those sort of photos like you could almost you know take the remote control car out the middle and replace it with a carcass which was perfect behavior but the most interesting thing from it was that actually for three days after they'd had access to that enrichment device we saw increases in hunting behaviors from them either play hunting each other or taking more of an interest in birds and things that were flying into the enclosure um, and we saw some nice int- nice changes as well in sort of social behaviors as well lower aggression rates and, and increased sort of affiliative behaviors as well so again to me that was a real kind of I'd read lots of research papers about the fact that, you know, enrichment shouldn't just be this sort of temporary, the animal interacted with it and it was done. There's actually a lot of stuff potentially happening long term with behavior that's being changed. And that was a really nice kind of, for me, cementing of that idea that we, we kind of need to look a bit more long term with, with what the animals are doing and, and how it's affecting their behavior. So, well, since then, we've done two more versions of the Lion Rover, but unfortunately, both of them were quite short lived studies because the devices actually weren't as good as we'd hoped they would be. So we didn't actually get the time to do the data, but it has kind of led on to a hopefully a fourth version that might be coming into development soon which i would be very grateful to try and get going again and then that led on to the we termed it the wobble ball basically if anybody's seen those kind of weasel balls that uh pet animals play with it's the little sort of weighted ball with a motor inside as the motor sort of spins around it makes the ball sort of wobble and, and move around in, in an unpredictable way we built a a lion sized version of that and just use that to just try and test some some movement um, and actually the only reason i did that was because for my dissertation research i wanted to do the lion rover stuff but we didn't have a working model at that time so i know when val was on she talked about the process that we use and going through that enrichment process of developing ideas and if something's not working kind of going back to the, the sort of the you know the brainstorming side of the process and one of my re- one of my supervisors at uni had said to me are you not making life difficult for yourself building a remote control car why don't you get a ready built car and stick it inside something like a ball to protect it and and drive that around and actually that idea didn't work but it was enough to sort of spark this idea that well hang on we can make this lion size weasel ball and we can try that instead so we did and we got some different predatory behaviors in terms of the animals actually started watching the prey species in the enclosures around them so there wasn't any active hunting it was just that suddenly they were spending more time watching the the zebras and the the giraffe that were walking around them and i've sub- subsequently followed that up with a couple of other studies with using sort of a more predictable kind of movement and actually we found the same kind of thing it's not this active predatory behavior it's the it's the watching stuff going on around them so I think there's a really interesting research line there, but I need to get the Lion Rover going again to or come up with other sort of more independently moving enrichment devices to kind of uh, to test this idea further. That's the that's the plan. That's that's what's in development right now. So the the original thought process behind it for you and, and um, tell me if I'm wrong here was to to make this Lion Rover. I don't know what the original name of it was. Was it always the Lion Rover? And it's always been the Lion Rover. It was named by the guy that built the first one. Yeah, like a, like a Land Rover. Yeah, basically play on play on words, pretty much. Yeah. And then the original idea was we put it in there, we zoom it around, and the lions are going to like chase it. The, the the whole point was supposed to be that we wanted to create a full hunting scenario. So we wanted to stalk, the chase, the capture and the kill without using live prey. In the UK, uh, you know, and like many countries, it's illegal for us to use live prey to simulate hunting behavior. And obviously, there's a huge amount of sort of ethical 
issues with doing that and you know the value of it to the the predatory species versus the detriment to the prey species depending on how how the scenarios are set up so that was that was what we wanted well that's what i wanted to do i wanted to find a an alternative that was as realistic as possible to create this hunting scenario so in some ways the lion rover worked but in some ways it failed because we didn't get a stalk going on because the cats were never far enough away from it to warrant that they just go straight into a spot it chase it and it didn't really move fast enough you know the original lion rover they kind of kept pace with it a little bit but it didn't really stretch them physically and uh, and so those kind of two behaviors were kind of were missing um we got the capture and we got the sort of the the kill behavior um but we didn't get those first two as much as we wanted to so in that case the process is still kind of continuing but there are other enrichment devices as well that we could use that would also simulate those things so that's kind of led on to some other ideas as well can we share the other ideas we can again the sort of well some of them are still in development i mean the chase sort of stuff obviously there's things around that people use like the lure systems and things but myself and my colleague chris are really trying to work on developing some some stalking devices which i think kind of leads on to the the zoo jam stuff that you wanted to talk about later as well so we can just kind of go straight into that now if you want yeah let's keep this conversation flying yeah so (laughs) um so basically the idea is to set up again using technology using what's available uh, to set up a system where the cats are presented with an opportunity to get their food in order to not lose that opportunity they have to perform stalking behavior so chris has actually been doing some simplified versions of this using a laser pointer and actually training his cats at home to perform that stalking behavior in order to earn a food reward um, so you can obviously do it through training as one option but our preferred is to do it through presenting enrichment opportunities um, so it's more under the control of the of the cats as and when they do it but we have a couple of different versions of an idea where they go through you know you get those um uh, motion sensors that on alarm systems and things if you walk really really slowly through those it doesn't always trigger if you walk st- fast through it it actually sets it off but if you walk slow enough and calmly enough through it then it, it doesn't actually necessarily trigger the the remote so you could have a system where if the cat sort of goes low and slow through the bit through the, the sensor they can actually get to a food reward whereas if they go fast rushing through it then say it's a box and the box closes so they lose that opportunity because they didn't show that behavior that we're after kind of thing so that's kind of what we we're working on at the moment and we're talking to a couple of different people who can do techie stuff who hopefully can get us there it sounds like the technology is there it's just setting it up to be successful i think in this scenario is the is the trick yeah and so we've had a, we had a bit throughout the whole conversation we've had a bit of a shift in goals would you mm-hmm. say Yes. Uh, yeah. So this one is primarily it just focused on one aspect of the stalking behavior. And and you additionally saw in your data that there was some added behaviors that you didn't initially consider. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Not that we didn't consider. It was just that. I, and uh, yeah, I guess in hindsight, there were behaviors that we should have expected to see. But it was it was interesting that by providing those active hunting opportunities, we were seeing an increase in that those behaviors being shown outside of the. the device presentations if that makes sense yes and and did that expand your definition of enrichment and what enrichment should be for our animals or is that kind of okay cool now we've seen something which already fit inside my definition of enrichment um i think a bit of both to be honest i think it was partly from you know reading books like by rob young and you know obviously sort of still the the bible for enrichment really then i was i mean that's the reason that for example i collected the data for three days after the device had gone in because i wanted to see if it was just a simple case of it's a temporary they get the chance to hunt they do the hunting and then their behavior returns to normal um so it was nice it was a it was a nice confirmation to me that you know that the these people that i'd been reading were what they were saying about there being more than just temporary effect was something that we really should be looking for mm-hmm. um and i think is a big part of what we miss out on in a lot of our enrichment work you know even the stuff that we, we're doing now we, without getting that data you really don't know exactly what's going on through the opportunities that these animals are getting through enrichment you know how that's actually affecting behavior long term i think there's a, a huge portion of research to go on with that but i think the predatory behavior is a really interesting specific focus for this kind of thing to, to really show how that works so then for for people listening so we've got zookeepers listening we've got carnival keepers listening and we've got other animal keepers listening that aren't carnival keepers how can we use this information to think about our goals i mean i'm sure we've got pet owners with dogs thinking about how we could potentially create something similar for Mm -hmm. for our pets what would your input be from what you've learned from this experience to to the listeners of this podcast to say what kind of 
considerations we should be thinking about when when coming up with enrichment items for our animals you mentioned that it wasn't just the predatory behavior the stalking and the pouncing that you got whilst the physical item was in there but these these flow on effects should this be a consideration for every enrichment item we're making uh, and and how important is us thinking about putting a new enrichment item into our animals life how important is that for for overall behavior management this stuff is it should be am i wrong tell me what you think uh, incorporated as part of a overall management plan for the animal we're trying to create species appropriate behaviors is that a good way of saying it yeah i think well and again it's sort of through through shapes ethos it's about it's about creating those opportunities it's about essentially giving your animals opportunities and then empowering them as to whether they they want to take those opportunities i mean that's that's kind of a a big thing that we see a lot someone spends a lot of time building an enrichment item they put it in and the animal's first response is not what they want to see you know you put a brand new feeder in for a, a primate for example and the primate completely ignores it or kind of takes one look at it and goes not today thank you and walks away and does something else and the temptation is then there to kind of you know tap the feeder or draw attention to the feeder or put a piece of food on top of the feeder and and draw the the animal back across and i completely understand why why we do i mean i you know i'm guilty of that as well i've certainly you know especially with the sort of the some of the stuff that we do which i know we're going to talk about later getting that initial response sometimes for me is very important but by doing that we are taking away that aspect of you know the the choice of interacting or not you know that animal has seen that there's something there it, it's not blind it can see that there's something there's something there that's new to interact with and if it chooses not to do it right now well then that should be okay they should be fine to walk away and they can come back and have a look later but in terms of your sort of question of how how much we need to think about you know these more than just temporary effects I, I think it is ideally it should be critical um, I think ideally in all of our enrichment planning we should be thinking about not just so the animal's going to interact with this and that's great and that's the job done it's you know how is this going to impact and how how is this going to develop but the time for keepers is incredibly limited the time for pet owners is incredibly limited I don't know any pet owners that have ever taken any serious data on their animals and what they're what it is that they're doing and and in order to get those answers it would be a rarity i think for people to really sort of sit down and go okay so i've presented this behavioral opportunity to my cat how has that changed their day i think that would be something to be definitely be applauded but it in reality it's not it's not on most people's priority lists so from my point of view at least stuff should be getting done and if we don't have the full picture of exactly what that's happening as long as it's not obviously detrimental I think that's still a positive thing that we should praise. But I think ideally, obviously, the gold standard of enrichment is getting that proper thorough evaluation, not just animal use the feeder. It worked OK, but we need to tweak it or, you know, it worked amazingly. We got these behaviours out of it and that's the job done. It's OK. So then for three hours afterwards, for three days afterwards, has there been any behavioural change? And I think for most keepers, that's a resource that doesn't necessarily exist at the moment, either because they haven't got the time or, you know, even when you get people doing research projects, I mean, I was an undergrad student doing a research project. I was only there for seven weeks and then I didn't go back and do that study again. So if you haven't got the resource of someone who can continually come back in and study it, then it's a really difficult question to answer. But I certainly think we should try whenever we can. I'm not sure that completely answers your question, though. No, I, I, think, I think it does. And, and I, having done the shape workshops and, and been in touch with, with you and Val and, uh, and a lot of other people that have participated in your workshops and consequently know the process of shape, the important aspects of the process, and you're going to speak to this far better than I am, um, a goal setting mm -hmm. and, and data collection, mm -hmm. um, but you've also realised you've also acknowledged the reality of life and people's access to go through this process and achieve everything else they need to in their day. Mm. Acknowledging all of that, so we acknowledge that enrichment is a process. We acknowledge that time is a is a scarce resource. What's the, what's the middle ground there? <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, no, definitely. I, I think there is a middle ground. I think at the very least, the kind of the uh, you know, there's a sort of a, a saying uh, came from uh, Jill Mellon from Disney that enrichment is the kind of the parsley. You know, the animal uh, the animal husbandry plate enrichment is the parsley that sits on top the idea is that you've got this great meal and you've got this lovely garnish on top that kind of finishes it all off but actually if you're in a hurry and you don't have time to put that little piece of greenery on top you've still got good animal husbandry underneath i'm not sure if i'm explaining that very well but um i like it it's but, but that's, that's that's the sort of the image but what we're really trying to get through to people is actually that's not the case if if you're serious about animal husbandry enrichment has to be a core part of the recipe if you're not doing enrichment if you're not doing focused goal orientated enrichment then you're actually missing an important part of the recipe and you can't it's not a finished plate you can present if, if that makes sense 
So understanding that there is a limited resource of time and that actually some people don't have the training to do sort of full formal data collection. There is a middle ground of sort of more informal evaluation, which you can as a sort of a quick and dirty kind of alternative, you can you can kind of make judgments as to whether your goals have been met. So whether you're looking to increase foraging time or whether you're looking to promote certain behaviors or whatever else. If you haven't got the time or the resources, genuinely haven't got the time and resources to, to do that more formal sort of data collection, there are simpler things that you can do that will at least guide you as to whether you've met those goals or not. And I think if you're not doing those things as a, as a basic, then you really have no idea if you're meeting your goals or not. And then you don't actually know if you are creating enrichment or, you know, you could just be creating an expensive waste of your, your manager's time kind of thing. You know, If you've spent money, you know, zoo budget and zoo time to, to build these things and just chuck them in and walk away without waiting to find out if you've actually achieved the results that you expected to. You can't say you're doing enrichment because you genuinely don't know. Does that kind of make sense? It does. And so you, you said you can't say you're doing enrichment. And, and I, I just I like to hear people's inputs on the definition of that then. What, for people listening to this podcast, and I don't know if you want to just give the shape definition or you want to give that, you know, if, if it's not the parsley on top, is, is enrichment the steak, the gravy or the potatoes? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of each. Um, no, I think the in terms of the definition then it's again it's there, there are several definitions of enrichment and and they're all actually pretty good but generally the core of each one is uh, and again this is a f- shape what we focus on is it is that you're providing a behavioral opportunity to an animal and you're empowering them to make the choices whether they engage in that or not with shape we want to make sure that the opportunities being provided are holistic so you know i know val talked about the five categories when she was on with you before so all of the enrichment that we do should encompass those five categories. And hopefully by encompassing those and having those included in, in what we're doing, we're giving our animals all of the things that they want and sorry, all the things that they need. And hopefully on top of that, things that they want as well. And then they should also be goal orientated so that, again, you know, we're not just taking a boom ball and we're chucking it in and we're going, yep, tick the, the lion, poured the boom ball. So it was enriched. It has a good life now because it, it had that but that boomer ball. It's what are we actually putting that boomer ball in for? What are we trying to achieve? And again, if you're doing this kind of proper goal focus, then what you probably see is that actually, yeah, the boomer ball has a very important place to play in an enrichment program, but it's not the be all and end all. There's a lot more levels that we need to hit in addition to that to say that we're providing holistic enrichment. Does that kind of make a bit more sense? Yeah, kind of. You know, yeah, I, I incorporated into a question because I've asked so many, it's <laughs> probably possible to answer them all um that the inclusion of an enrichment item is part of the overall management of the animal's behavior mm-hmm. um, and you mentioned the five categories quickly i know val's mentioned them on the show before but i am a fan of repetition <laughs> can you just quickly mention those five for the people listening just so they know what you're talking about yeah absolutely so in terms of the five categories that shape uses uh they've got social uh, enrichment physical habitat sensory cognitive and then obviously food-based enrichment and when we're talking about those five categories they don't have to be you know one enrichment item doesn't have to be mutually exclusive it could be an enrichment item that you know a puzzle feeder that you put in for example obviously comes under food but if it's a puzzle feeder it's also probably cognitive and you know if it's a group of primates it could have a social aspect to it as well if you only put one puzzle feeder in to a social group then there's going to be a dominance hierarchy of over who has access to that and stuff so there'll be a social component too for example so the aim for us is to make sure that we're hitting multiples in each of those categories providing opportunities for each of those categories and then and allowing animals choices within those categories that again as i say hopefully give them everything they want and need mm. and so for those listening you want to build upon all of your understanding of this stuff the best way to do it i would suggest is to attend the shape workshop <laughs> what do you think mark well obviously yeah i that would be lovely but i think you know again we want we want this stuff to be accessible so there are there are ways of getting hold of a hold of this information online um obviously on the shape website which i know you've shared before we always love it when you share it again but yeah there's there's resources out there that you can at least get a taste of this stuff and, and have a look at this stuff but yeah i mean obviously on a this is a very potted version when we do the shape workshops you know it's anywhere from three and a half to six days that we spend really kind of digging deep into this creating these holistic and goal-oriented programs so yeah obviously it's this is just kind of scratching the surface really mm, so visit, visit the shape website i will link to it in the write-up how, how's things working at the moment uh, 
are there up and coming workshops people can find out about or how does that information get released uh, is, is there a space on the website people can check out uh, there should be we are having some website issues at the moment so it's not actually kept quite as up to date as it uh, as we'd like it to be but we're, we're working on that right now but actually also probably facebook is probably the best way whenever we do workshops and things that are, are, are publicly accessible we would pretty much always advertise them on there um so yeah shape of enrichment international facebook page is is a good one and then we also have a number of regional pages as well so depending on where in the world you are the regionals usually advertise on on their own sites as well as the international page too so you can kind of see what activities are going on in your parts of the world as well Fantastic. So you've been, as mentioned in your bio, doing a lot of these workshops on the international stage. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the other workshops you've been up to and some of the other opportunities uh, specifically in Europe that people have access to moving forward? Yeah, no, definitely. Well, I mean, so you mentioned at the beginning that we obviously run um, the student environmental enrichment courses. And this is something we actually started because uh, one of the first times I got involved in Shape was actually hosting Val at Port Lim and Howlett's. We did the first sort of UK Shape workshop. And what we found was that we had a lot of people registering to come along, uh, most of which were keepers, which was the sort of the audience that we were after. But we also had a lot of students who were trying to come along as well. And the target audience that we had was, as I say, the keepers. So we had a reserve list of students who wanted to come along and take part, but we kind of, we only filled up the last sort of spaces at the end. So we, we realized there was demand for, for students who were currently kind of looking for their way into the zoo world or the animal world who wanted to learn this stuff. But obviously, if we do these, we don't get to do the, the keeper workshops as often as we'd like so we wanted to kind of make sure that they were uh, they were accessible to keepers so we kind of tried out the first student course and uh, it is based on um, the shape framework we teach all the same kind of core materials as we would in shape but we also have a lot of things in there that are aimed at people who are looking to get their foot in the door so we teach practical skills like rope splicing and fire hose weaving and things that people can put on their CVs. And the idea is that actually they kind of, you know, if they're going, get the chance to go for an interview, for example, they can kind of bring in practical experiences and say, look, you know, this is something that I can do. This is something I can bring to your department. And the idea is it enhances their, their potential for getting a, a job in the future and becoming more employed. From our point of well of view as well, also, you know, we want to get to the, the young, enthusiastic people who are coming into the into this community and and hit them while they're sort of their minds are open and we want to kind of set them on the path of you know if they get into these jobs enrichment is a, is a key part of of the start of that journey to make sure that not only do they they know about it but they also hopefully have some practical applications of how to how to make it work because that's the other thing we find a lot is that people are interested in enrichment and they want to do enrichment but they don't always have the know-how that or the confidence even you know a lot of people have got the practical skills they just don't have the confidence to actually employ them um to make some of this stuff happen so um providing them with those opportunities is um is kind of a, a key part of what we want to want to do we have sort of student courses that are available at the moment the mo they are pretty much based in the uk but um we are working on a, a a new plan at the moment of trying an international uh seek which we're sort of um we're still kind of developing at the moment we're quite excited about the the location that we've hopefully got lined up to do that next june um, which is, which is uh, actually in Thailand. So um, the plan is that we've been invited by um, an elephant sanctuary in Thailand to come and hold a seek there. They're actually going through some changes at the moment where they're, they're going from the kind of the, the usual tourist attraction facility and they're trying to change to a much more ethical sort of uh, tourist model and they actually want to use enrichment as part of their, their education program. Um, and as part of their, instead of people coming and going on elephant rides or standing and having their photos taken with the elephants, they actually want to have enrichment as the kind of the elephants interacting with enrichment as their the kind of the core attraction. And so they were interested in the idea of us coming out and bringing some international students who have a slightly different perspective, probably, I would imagine, to kind of come in and try some new ideas and things. So we're quite excited about where this sort of could take us if, if it works well. So so these Sikhs, they're just four students. Students, keepers attend these as no, well we do actually although although they're primarily marketed at the students um yeah we actually get quite a few keepers who attend a lot of the time the, the places that are hosting actually send some of their own keepers along in exchange for having us there um and then we have also got you know we've had quite a few keepers who've just applied to come along again because we don't do as many of the, the keeper workshops as we'd like so the material is essentially the same and actually there's been a lot of crossover recently between um so on the shape courses we actually now add in things like rope splicing and fire hose weaving and stuff you know as and where there's an interest to do that because again 
you know something like rope splicing it's kind of key for for safety for a lot of the species that we work with you know rope's one of the most dangerous things in the zoo if you can work with it in a safer way and a more cost effective way then that's a really good skill to have but it's still restricted to some keepers who have done it professionally or have kind of taught themselves and stuff so so it's we do get quite a few keepers attending too and apart from thailand do you have information about your next workshops and where people can go to find more information about this yeah absolutely well so again the the seeks are primarily advertised on the facebook page so it's just student environmental enrichment courses uh, if you search for that you should find us but we have a we have a public workshop also in august uh, there's a private monkey sanctuary in ascot um, in the uk which um, isn't open to the public and as you mentioned i'm a trustee for them so it's kind of a way for us to push forward the enrichment there and and also provide a bit of funding for stuff that they do we've run them there for the last few years and they work really well so we're going to be there again in august um, with availability for spaces Moving on, the other project which takes up a huge chunk, if not most of your time, is, and you mentioned it throughout this podcast so far, is your business, Team Building with Byte. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So basically, we, again, uh, myself and my colleague Chris, were looking to try and expand the enrichment ideas that we were doing when we worked back at Howlett's and Port Lim. And as with everything in life, it's time and money tend to be the biggest sort of limiting factors. And so we started to develop corporate team building workshops um, where the corporates come in and they basically pay to build enrichment devices as a nice team building activity. It's something a bit different and unusual. And then at the end of that, we then take them to the exhibit um, and they actually get to see the keepers put the stuff that they've built in with the animals and hopefully see a response. Um, Although we do kind of prep them from the very beginning that, you know, if you're working with animals, you can't guarantee anything. You know, we get some animals that we are assuming are going to be a dead cert to come and interact and they completely ignore it. And we get some animals that were like, these guys are really shy. There's no way they're going to go near it for two days and they come straight over and start using it. But for corporate groups that, you know, spend most of their time, you know, sitting on keyboards and working in offices and stuff to start with picking up you know drills and saws to to build something and and actually construct something is is really out of their comfort zone but because they know they're doing it for animals it adds a whole level of kind of you know a really nice tangible outcome for them a lot of team building stuff that we've sort of seen previously there's no you know you spend like a couple of hours doing something and then at the end of it you know the stuff gets chucked chucked in the skip out the back or it gets deconstructed for the next group to come along and build it whereas with this stuff it really is kind of a, a meaningful activity. We've still got stuff in enclosures that was built six years ago that's still being used on a daily basis by primates and stuff. So we don't go for the simple stuff. We don't we don't want to see cardboard boxes and paper mache ever on our workshops. We want to see stuff that's built to last and is, is going to really add value to the animals' lives, but also be really user friendly for the keepers as well. Because at the end of the day, they're actually our main stakeholder. If the if the keepers don't like it or it's not easy to use then it hasn't been a worthwhile workshop. So pretty much everything we build's got carabiners and easy, you know, quick fixes and stuff that make it easy to use and quick. Unless we're building, a, you know, a tiger platform or something, which is once it's in, it's in. There's nothing, nothing's going to move that, hopefully. But yeah, it's uh, it's quite a mix of stuff that we we can do. We've done 100 workshops to date and we love doing them. We, we love people watching anyway. So it's really nice to see the groups kind of getting stuck into to these designs. And it really allows us to play around with ideas ideas that we want to prototype and that we'd have no funding to do otherwise these corporate groups are quite happy to pay to to have a go and uh, and test things out and develop them so we like kind of doing workshops with version two and version three and version four models to to see how we can progress ideas and stuff version 100 (laughs) yes with the lion raver probably yes hey congratulations on 100 workshops thank you yeah that was a big we were we were really hoping we were going to get that in before the end of the year and we literally just did it last week so um we're quite pleased to have that under our belt but we're we're looking forward to the next 100 and how long has that been um so so we actually ran 50 workshops while we were still at Howlett's in Port Lim. And then we took, uh, we both took voluntary redundancy coming up to four years ago now um, in February, it'll be four years. So yeah, we've done the, the next 50 in four years, but there's been a rapid increase in the first year we were self-employed. We only did two. So yeah, we're, we're hoping to be to be bigger and better next year. We're working with a couple of new facilities that we've got lined up, um, again, based in the UK for the moment that we're hoping we're adding on adding onto our partnership list. So new species and new exciting opportunities, I hope. And can you remember your first ever workshop? 
Uh, I can actually. It was a Christmas party, and uh, unfortunately, the message had not got through to the uh, the guys doing the organising about what was happening, and so they'd had some mulled wine before they turned up, which was an interesting addition to uh, the health and safety of the project. But yeah, it was actually really nice because the guys that did our very first workshop actually came back, and they also did our fiftieth workshop. It was quite cool to to have that repeat, and for them to see how it had changed from the very first one they did to how we sort of scaled it up by the time they came for the fiftieth one. So if you could say that the top three things you've learned from doing 100 team building or bite workshops what, what might they be well again it's that whole crazy idea goes a long way when we first sort of started doing it we sort of really had to think about was this actually going to work and especially when we took it self-employed was it really going to be something that was, was going to take off but i think getting creative is is definitely a big part of that we, we we say that every workshop we do is bespoke and it genuinely is but it that in some ways it allows us a lot of fun we had a, a group that said they wanted the theme of their activity to be innovation so we actually had them building catapult systems to scatter feed for bears at Portland. But the idea was obviously, you know, we know people have used catapults and things before, and and that's great if you've got people there to do it. But actually, what what about the times that you're not there? So Chris actually developed a, a really cool system to turn it into a timed catapult. The actual catapult system didn't work that well, but the timing system worked perfectly. So our next version two workshop will improve on the catapult one. But the group had an amazing day. They really enjoyed it. And although the bears didn't quite get the scatter of food that they wanted that we were after it's the first step on one of those journeys so i think one of the main lessons from from 100 workshops is that actually even if the enrichment devices don't quite work first time round, the, the groups have still had an amazing experience and, and it just allows us to, to try again with a new group and, uh, and tweak the design and, and get it working. I think one of the other main lessons that we've learned from 100 workshops is you can never guarantee what's going to take off on Facebook. Part of the idea for us is that we honestly want to share these ideas and hope that other keepers around the world are going to see them and want to try them out themselves once we've kind of worked out the, the bugs and stuff. And there has been some things that we've put up that we've been absolutely sure, you know, oh, the animal keepers are going to go crazy for this and it's going to go viral and you get nothing at all. And then you put something up, (laughs) you you put something up that you just think, oh, this is the simplest thing ever. And I think that still our biggest video that we've ever posted is a lion with a hessian sack. It's just like almost got to 100,000 views. And yet we put up, we did a, a device with um, eye eyes that I was just over the moon with. And I was like, it's the, one of the coolest things we've ever built. And I think it got like maybe 4,000 views. And I was just like, why are people not sharing this? But that's just life, isn't it, at the end of the day? And you've shared that I one with me, haven't you? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, you said you're, you're building these things to last. You've done 100 workshops. You designed a catapult. You learned that it didn't work very well. But you basically got this business that it also allows you to do a whole bunch of market research. And you can build another whole business off this. I mean, imagine two, 300 workshops later, you're going to have a whole arsenal of marketable enrichment devices you'd think um <laughs> that, that, that would be that would be lovely that would be my retirement plan yeah that would be a cool thing and actually we have been approached previously by companies saying can you design enrichment items for us and there's a part of me that wants to have a comfortable life and provide for my family and stuff and go yeah that sounds like an easy way to make some money but i think the whole point of us doing this and again you know team building with bite and shape we have the same ethos we have the same vision team building with bite was born out of shape essentially we want to share these ideas because we want people to do more enrichment for their animals so although that sounds a little cheesy and you know you can't make a living out of that as long as the team building still pays i'd rather we had 500 team building workshops that pay the bills and we were able to put out 50 cool ideas that people can actually go away and reproduce on their own and stuff that then you know benefit animals lives in the future that's that's the aim if we come up with a really cool idea that is actually very marketable and stuff, I'm not saying we never would go down that route, but that's not what we're aiming for. When we do these workshops, we're not looking to prototype stuff that we can sell in the future. We're looking to, to benefit as many animals as we can. Mm, the, the catapult, an effective version, two, three, four, five, whatever one it is, just seems like a very... Uh useful resource for a lot of species and a lot of zoos definitely and i mean that's kind of the aim i mean obviously there are technological feeding devices out there at the moment that do that job you know you've got some really cool devices that are on the market now that you can use wi-fi to set them off and do you know remote scatter feeds from sitting in bed at home and stuff and that's that's amazing the fact that we we have those things now but there's still a lot of places that we work in that would never be able to afford those things in a million years so if we can come up with a slightly less effective but still 
controllable timed scatter device, for example, you could make with a bag full of water, which is essentially what it would be, and a sort of simplified version of a slingshot, then that's an option for people that, that can't afford to buy these more technological devices and stuff. So it's not meant to be competition. It's just meant to provide another option, really. So you said um, uses a bag of water? Yeah. So Chris basically designed this system where the pin for the catapult is held in place on a, a, a is attached to a bag one, one of those sort of big water bags that you can buy um, and so the idea is as you sort of open the tap the water drains out and obviously you know if you have it set to a very sort of slow drip over a period of however long the water slowly drains out and the bag is actually attached to a bungee so the bag becomes lighter and lighter the bungee lifts up and the idea is it pulls the pin out and releases the catapult so it's actually something that could be hopefully quite user friendly because again obviously you know if it's something that's really fiddly and complicated to fill and stuff then even if it is quite cool it's not going to get used but yeah it's quite a simple system that you can kind of reuse and refill um, and then essentially it is a very cheap timer system it also shows why me and chris work quite well together because my original plan was to have basically the rope kind of encased in an ice block so as the ice slowly melts you know it's the same idea but in order to do that, you have to have the ropes set up in a fridge, you know, set up in a freezer days in advance and everything else. So, yeah, Chris kind of said, well, that's a nice idea, but actually here's a better way of doing it, which is, again, the whole point of enrichment stuff. And, and again, the shape is bouncing ideas back and forward off people. So I tend to come up with crazy ideas. And then Chris is very practical and works out how to make them actually work in reality. So, you know, the ideas that we have kind of developed through that, that bouncing backwards and forwards. And I think that's quite a cool thing to have. You know, one of the things that I always feel trainers and enrichment creators, animal managers, behavior managers have benefit from developing as creativity and being able to implement a creative process. And you just mentioned your team kind of process there. You come up with the crazy ideas and Chris practically works through them. Have you got anything else that you can add to that for the people listening? Because some people find the creative part a little bit challenging sometimes. Have you got any other tidbits that you guys use when you're trying to be creative? Um, I think it's just get inspiration from anywhere. I mean, it's again, a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do through enrichment actually already exists in one form or another elsewhere, you know, and, and instead of constantly trying to recreate the wheel sort of thing, we if we kind of look out at the wider world and see what's available and what, you know, what resources are out there, then actually... We could probably skip a lot of the, the heartache and the failures that we experience. The the creative side of it is, again, we kind of talk a lot at Shape about, you know, people get stuck in their boxes of they do the same job day in, day out. And obviously working with animals, there's always, you know, fluctuations in that and stuff. But you you do get into a mindset of this is what we can do. This is what works. This is what we're going to sort of stick to. But using things like the Shape process and the, you know, the brainstorming part of the Shape process where you really do just go wild and, you know, you just have to say, look, I don't care that I know what's possible. If anything is going to meet this goal and throw ideas out there and actually come back with something that could potentially work. We always use as an example on the student courses when we're, we're teaching the brainstorming process. I always use the example of we've got a troop of lazy colobus monkeys that just lie around all day doing nothing. So your behavioral goal is to increase behavioral diversity and then I throw it out to the group and you know they have to then throw back ideas at me and I encourage them as much as possible to be as crazy as possible but with British audiences we can be quite reserved sometimes and so what tends to happen is Chris is at the back of the room throwing out as crazy ideas as he possibly can and on our very first workshop you know we were set, the, the group wasn't coming up with stuff and so he said oh monkey Facebook you know monkey pub so at the end, when we then kind of go criteria, OK, so we can't take the monkeys to the pub. One student kind of nervously put her hand up and said, actually, you know, in the pub, you get those mixer bottles with a little sort of, you know, the measuring tap that's built in at the bottom. And so actually, if you had lots of bottles dotted around the enclosure with different flavored liquids, the monkeys could go and try the different liquids and that would increase their activity. Right. That would get them moving around. Which actually, you know, if you're talking about colorless monkeys, you could probably do that with hamster bottles. You don't need to go and, you know, raid the pub for the the, the the empty vodka bottles and stuff. But, you know, you could have hamster bottles dotted around the enclosure with different flavored liquids and that would meet the goal. That's an idea that we'd never have come up with if we just went, OK, we need to get the colorless monkeys more active. What, what can we do? Do you know what I mean? It really kind of it opens a whole range of doors that you suddenly think, you know, that is actually a stupid or insane idea. But there's something in there that we can use that actually perfectly meets the goal we'd never have come up with otherwise and pretty much every time we do um we do that brainstorming thing someone says colobus trampoline colobus catapult 
And after about four or five years of hearing that, Chris and I went, should we just build a Columbus catapult? So we got one of our team, 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 team building groups to do it. <laughs> you know, It was just like, and it was quite literally built on a kind of a catapult system that the sort of the, the branches that they bounce off to launch themselves from one tree to another. We built a little sort of mini catapult bungee that they could literally bounce off with a feeder attached to it. So again, it's version one, so it needs to be tweaked slightly, but actually it worked really nicely. So those crazy ideas that you just kind of would normally just go, no, that's ridiculous. I'm not not dealing with that. If you actually think about them a bit, then maybe they can take you somewhere you wouldn't expect to go. Yeah. And I'm really excited that you shared that example because Val shared that example when she came to New Zealand 2014 or, or a similar one. And I was, I was the monkey trying pub, to, monkey yeah, pub one. Yeah. And I was trying to get Val to share it in the podcast and she didn't. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, and the takeaway, and, and I think listening to that example, listening to the shape process of of brainstorming literally changed my life because it's helped me be creative and I think there's a lot of value if you're listening to this podcast uh, to listen to what Mark's saying and, and go back and listen to the episode of Val and hear Val talk about brainstorming but maybe build on on my interpretation of it because once again you're, you're going to speak better to this than I am but the whole idea of that brainstorming process is that we don't judge in that brainstorming process we're not thinking about why things will or won't work we're just thinking of ideas yeah absolutely it's, there's no no negative feedback so it's a you know it's a safe space basically everything the the three rules of brainstorming is you say whatever comes into your head no matter how ridiculous you write absolutely everything down and there's no criticism there's no oh no we can't do that because because obviously if you're in that situation if you are brave enough to throw out a crazy idea and somebody turns around and says hey, that's a really stupid thing to say everybody else in that circle is just going to shut down it has to be a safe space where you can just literally say whatever the hell you like again one that i throw out all the time is let's throw a chimpanzee in with the colobus monkeys i'm never going to throw a chimpanzee in with the colobus monkeys but it would meet the goal it would get them active it would get them moving around and again if you really think about it there are things that you can take away from that that you could actually put into practice that would work that would meet the goal it might be a little bit stressful for the colobus monkeys and you'd have to make the decision of whether that was a good thing or a bad thing and whether it really met your goal or not but technically it would provide stimulation in their life it would give them behavioral opportunities and those could end up being a positive thing one of the, the one of the people i first met when i went to howlett's was the head keeper of primates and he actually wanted to put the lion rover in with the macaques you know he wanted to have it run in with the tigers first and then he wanted to stick it in with the macaques so that this thing started moving in their enclosure that stank of a predator and his goal was to create social cohesion in the group allow the dominant male to do his job of the sort of the defensive alarm calling and everything else and then have the rest of the group huddle together in a kind of a communal uh, we're scared and we want to we want the reassurance of this big social group that we're in we didn't do it there would have been quite a few safety reasons not to have done it because apart from anything the lion river wasn't designed for little monkey paws that could reach in and rip out wiring and stuff but again, that would have met the goal of the head keeper perfectly. And so the idea is that no matter how crazy the idea is and, and how in your mind you might think, oh, this is just a crazy idea, someone else might hear that and, and their worldview and then looking at that idea through their unique eyes, they're going to make some connection that you might have missed and, and therefore something amazing might come out of it, like your example with the Colobus monkeys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no way Monkey Pub would have ever gone any further than that if that one student hadn't have put a hand up and gone, that could work. So yeah, it's just allowing allowing the imagination to run wild and then it doesn't have to be you that takes the idea forward. It could be somebody else that, that comes up with that inspiration from that. So if you're listening to this podcast and you think that your team could benefit from a team building with bike workshop. Where do you, where do people go to find out more information about this stuff, Mark? Uh, so um, yeah, you can find out more information. Um, we've got our website, which is teambuildingwithbike.com or .co.uk, and also our Facebook page, which has got a lot of videos on there um, of all the stuff that we've done previously. Every time we do a workshop, we we post up stuff on there. So even that as a resource for potential ideas and things is, is out there. But yeah, if you're a, a keeper and you uh, and you think your collection could benefit from having some crazy guys coming and test lots of weird enrichment ideas then um, we're always looking for uh, for new places to partner with and um, new opportunities new species to work with that would be uh, that'd be awesome great information and i know there's loads of people who listen to the show for whom this is going to be highly beneficial so thank you very much for sharing that mark next i was hoping to talk about the research side of enrichment i know re research is something you're super interested in mark do we need more research i know that's a silly question but i <laughs> ask it anyway and what research do we need do you think moving forward into 2018 uh, yes, absolutely. Um, always more research. And, and there is a never ending list of, of research possibilities. And it's, there's never enough people to, to conduct that research, which 
is a bugbear of a lot of people in the zoo world, I think. One of the lines of research I'm really interested in at the moment is um, actually the impact of enrichment on visitors, because I think this is a line that can be not only beneficial for the animals, but also for pushing forward enrichment programs. So this is something I've only really just started scratching the surface with, really, but I've got a, a couple of ideas that I want to take forward, and, and I'm now sort of partnering with a couple of people and trying to do that. But the sort of the first time I managed to, to look into this, um, we built some enrichment devices at, at Howlett's in Portland um, that were designed to actually increase our attendance at talks because I used to be obviously on education. We used to want to do talks about the Javan gibbon that was housed at Howlett's because this was a species that the park's actually doing reintroduction work with. They've got a project site in Java, you know, that they're, they're obviously funding. So from the park's point of view, this is a key species to talk about. Um, but what we found was that when we were advertising gibbon talks to the public, um, we were getting on average 2.4 people turning up per talk which is depressing as an educator because obviously unless you're a real sadist you're not going to do a talk to two, two people um and force them to stand there and listen to you for 15 minutes so you know it always ended up being like a, a short q a and then people would kind of drift off but obviously it also wasn't meeting the, the park's aim so we actually managed to get a little bit of funding to build some pulley systems on the outside of the enclosures no there's nothing new about a pulley system but a lot of people who have pulleys for their primates use them inside the enclosure which again there's nothing wrong with that but normally for that to actually work you have to either go in with the animal or you have to you know shift the animal into the house lower the pulley down put the food on shift the animal back out pull the pulley back up which potentially is time consuming and it also meant that you know you had to have keeper involvement so we actually set the pulley systems up on the outside of the enclosure so that you didn't have to shift the animals. And actually, as a member of the education, you know, any of my education guys could turn up at the enclosure, obviously with permission from the keepers beforehand, lower the pulley down, hook the food on, raise the pulley back up. No animals need to be shifted, no keeper times taken up. And we started using these during some of our some of our talks. And what it meant was the primates, you know, the gibbons were right at the front of the enclosure interacting with the whatever was on the pulley. And it just helped us to draw a crowd in. Uh, and so once we started using these pulley systems during some of our talks, the average attendance went up to 25.9 people, which that's a number you can start doing proper public talks to. And, you know, also we were finding that people were hanging around for longer. Previously, we've been there for like, you know, 15, 20 minutes, maybe if we were lucky. But with the pulley behind us, we were there for about 45 minutes answering questions and stuff and just chatting to people about these amazing animals that were right behind us, you know, stretching their arms out and stuff. So that was a really cool finding. It was something we kind of assumed was obvious, but it was nice to, to at least have the numbers to back that up. But what I then also found was that, so I'd do these talks, I'd then walk off and go and do another talk somewhere else, but I'd be walking backwards and forwards past this enclosure through the day. And what I found was that there was still Gibbons using whatever was on the pulley system. And as a result, there seemed to still be a crowd of people standing and watching them. So I thought, well, this is a perfect line of research, but I have absolutely no time to collect any data on it. And luckily at one of the international enrichment conferences, I'd seen a poster about people using camera traps. Um, they'd actually been using them to monitor penguin enrichment interactions. So they'd had them on the sensors so that, you know, when the penguins approached the enrichment, the camera traps would start filming what they were doing to see what the interaction was. So I thought this was a cool idea and I decided to rip it off. So basically had one camera that was pointed up at where the pulley system was on the gibbon enclosure and then a second camera pointed at the visitor area right in front of it. So it took photos every 30 seconds and we found that when we compared the baseline day, which would be the Saturday where there was no pulley in use, to the Sunday where the device was in use, we got a significant increase in the gibbons in that area, but we also got a significant increase in the numbers of people standing in and watching what the gibbons were doing. So I was actually able to take this data to my bosses and go, look, you know, actually enrichment's good for the public can I have some more money, please? And we'll build some more enrichment that's good for the public. And so we were then able to build a number of other devices with that money that improved the public experience, but obviously ultimately also improved the animal's welfare as well. So, you know, I have no problem with enrichment's goal being to improve the visitor experience because the animals will still ultimately benefit from it if it's done right. Um, and I'd really like to see more research done on onto that kind of thing if possible. And that's one pretty good way from your story there in something we can take away from it is to pitch that to you managers isn't it yeah absolutely yeah if you if you're trying to kind of loosen the purse strings a bit then if you can find a way of tweaking whatever it is that you're doing to benefit the public somehow then we we were actually able to get money off marketing rather than the animal department which is a whole new you know budget area for example so yeah we were able to build the the anteater window feeder which i think you've got the video of and which i really want to try and now we we built one recently at longleat 
for a team build and we're actually going to repeat the camera trap study there so we'll have the camera set up again the day before and the day of to see if the anteaters are there at the window using these canister feeders is it actually pulling in more public and and are they as the visitor experience hopefully being improved obviously that's quite a lot of extrapolation from just taking still photos every 30 seconds but at least it gives us some idea. And I think you can do more stuff as well. Like you can look at, if you're looking at the faces as well, you can see how many photos the faces are there for. So you can then start to at least estimate, you know, length of time people are staying as well. But I didn't have time to sit there and count faces over and over again. So that's that's for, for a student who needs a research project to do. All right. So if you're a student listening to this or if you're a keeper who might be doing similar things or interested in research, what, what would your suggestion be to these people? Um, if you can invest in a couple of camera traps, you know, and I know they're not the cheapest things, but you can get a, a reasonably decent camera trap for, you know, around £100 or so. Then if you're a keeper, then you're interested in this information. I think if you can start taking these photos um, and then sharing them with your, if you've got a research department or if you've got contacts with local unis, these things make perfect research projects. The, the student doesn't actually have to come to the zoo at all, but if they can go through these photos and actually kind of pull as much information out of them as possible, then there's a perfectly reasonable research project there that you can do statistics with. Even if it's just simple statistics, that's still that's still a reasonable dissertation. And if you are a student who wants to do this kind of thing and wants to do, take it a bit more in depth, you could then start doing comparisons of the camera trap data versus you taking live data and working out you know what's being missed for example you know are, are we losing information by just taking it from the stills or actually is it a reliable way of getting that information there's a whole list of research projects i can think of that you could take from just sort of that quite simple study and i guess another potential research line could be then um, and tell me if you've done anything along these lines talking to visitors and, and collecting information from visitors about what information they're leaving the zoo with yes absolutely yeah um there was a study done at Central Park Zoo years ago now where they did actually look at the enrichment in the polar bear exhibit there what they actually found was that just by seeing the polar bear the visitors seem to be taking away more knowledge about them which was interesting and again if you can use enrichment obviously to draw the animals out if just seeing them is enough then that's kind of an interesting line in itself but the other thing they also found was that the visitors had an expectation of what enrichment was those that were asked that, that knew what enrichment was and if they weren't seeing things like plastic barrels and you know plastic balls and things they assumed there was no enrichment being done if the enrichment was actually naturalistic and made to fit in the visitors weren't necessarily spotting it and so they assumed that there wasn't enrichment being done so it was actually through a conversation with a colleague that they actually suggested that another line of this would actually be to see do the visitors understand what what is enrichment if there's enrichment in the exhibit what actually is it and, and that's a whole other line as well so as i say there's a million and one questions and and not enough answers that at the moment anyway that are coming out yeah exciting exciting area moving forward hey thank you so. thank you so much for all of us sadly we are nearly at the end and it's probably good because you probably want to go to bed soon. <laughs> <laughs> there. But just before we do, we're, we're going to just cover one of my favourite areas of the podcast show. And you've already shared so many great stories uh, with us today, Mark. But could, could you potentially share one or more two stories from your great experience working with enriching animals so far in any any lessons you've learned from these along the way? Yeah, I found this question really difficult, actually. I was trying to sort of like, I think I've already talked about quite a lot of the, the sort of the, the fun stuff that we've done, but there was a couple that I did sort of think of. That, well, one of them, again, was I think the through the team building stuff, we actually had a, when we built the, the Colibus catapults, actually, we, um, it was one of those moments where we had the, the people kind of turned up and most of them were middle-aged ladies who, when they saw the, the sort of the drills and the saws on the table, they just kind of took one look and were like, you've got to be kidding me. This is, this is not happening. And then we explained what it was they were going to be doing. And they were just like, genuinely, you're, you, you know, you're taking the mickey now. This isn't, this isn't possible. It's not achievable. And by the end of the workshop, we actually put the devices in with the monkeys and they all, they, all the groups finished. They all did an amazing job actually but we we put these devices in with the monkeys and one of the ladies just literally was so overwhelmed by what she'd done that she literally burst into tears and it was like that to me was a real moment of you know this is there's a real powerful connection here and I really think we can make the most of that you know obviously the zoo world at the moment is getting a lot of abuse from several different sides and 
I think it's hard to stay motivated sometimes within all that abuse and within all those pe- these people questioning our motives and, and our successes. But something like that, that really just shows that, you know, that this, this powerful kind of connection that, that people have with animals and to provide those opportunities that you wouldn't get in any other kind of setting, I think really kind of was a nice reminder to me that, you know, actually we are doing, we're doing good work and we kind of need to remember that. And I think that's something, you know, a lot of people are struggling with at the moment. Sort of, You see all the message boards and stuff of people kind of really taking a kicking on one form or another. And I just think I think that's that was a really good moment for me where it just sort of reinforced that what we were doing was was good and, and that we need to keep doing what we're doing, really. And then there's another sort of story that we had that, well, there's a, again, it's kind of a little bit to do with the, the perception that people have with keepers and enrichment. And um, I'm sure, you know, most of your listeners that work in the zoo world will have had this sort of thing about old school keepers. And again, I kind of think that, you know, this sort of we put labels on things and, and then people kind of get stuck on this idea of, you know, anybody who's been in the profession for X number of years must be quite old school in their opinions and stuff. And, and we actually did a workshop where we had a, a, a basically a, one of the one of the sort of the younger keepers in the room kind of asked this question of, you know, how do you deal with with old school keepers who aren't interested in enrichment and who who are who are kind of fighting you as you're trying to develop ideas and stuff and so, certainly from my experience I mean I've, I've been guilty of of making this judgment as well certainly you know when I was fresh out of uni and I was working with keepers who'd been in the profession for a long time and I didn't necessarily have the respect for them that I that they deserved because I had preconceptions about them and, and what I was trying to do and, and them trying to get in the way so we kind of started answering this question and then actually one of the ladies in the room who was who had been a keeper for many many years sort of kind of piped up and and actually got again quite emotional about the fact that you know she'd been doing this job for a long time and and actually it was quite hard to see all the changes and things that were coming in and that that actually that she'd been doing her best all of this time and and to then sort of be labeled as somebody who was you know not not doing a good job or or not doing their best you know not doing their best or not not allowing things to kind of move forward and stuff was actually a really hard label to deal with and again i think that's a really important lesson for people to especially kind of new enthusiastic people coming into the profession you know we always say this again on the student courses that you know if i don't care if you've got a degree or not if you're coming in to work with someone who's got you know 10 15 25 years experience then there's a lot you've got to learn from these individuals whether or not they've got a degree or not and I think Val kind of touched on this as well in, in her podcast, but it's this idea that when, when we're coming in and doing this training, sometimes the assumption is we're telling people that they're doing a bad job. And actually, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is you've been doing the best job that you can do with the knowledge that you have. And what we're doing is hopefully giving you some more information. And now you've got that information and hopefully kind of implement that and things. But I think there's just this misconception that old school keepers are, are blocking things and getting in the way is not accurate, if that makes sense. And, and I think we need to be careful about that. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it's beautifully said. And I know that's going to resonate with a lot of people. It definitely resonated with me as you're talking about those stories. And so thank you very much for sharing that, Mark. We're going to now go to our last question. Can you, for this part, Mark, please take us into the future and share right. what you would like to see happen in the next five to 10 years in, in the enrichment world? Um, oh, How long have you got? We're at the end now, aren't we? <laughs> um, I think I... I struggle with this question a little bit. There's a lot of people who say, you know, it's amazing how far we've come in all these years of, of, of from people sort of really first sort of starting to use enrichment as a, you know, it, it does get termed as a buzzword. And I, I kind of think in some cases it is a bit of a buzzword, but, you know, really since the sort of the, the 90s or whatever, when it when it really kind of became a mainstream word that was used and, and encouraged people to, to take it forward. And I agree to an extent that, yes, things have come a way, but I wish they'd come a bit further. And I would really like to see things speed up uh, significantly in the, the near future and certainly in the next five to 10 years. I think I think the potential is huge. And I think the biggest thing from my point of view is really building in enrichment opportunities into new build exhibits. I think when you see new exhibits being built where enrichment has been added on at the very end, or there's been some cool enrichment ideas that were supposed to be put in, but then budget meant that those things weren't possible and so they got cut and I think that's very limiting to to what we can do so really sort of seeing places make a genuine commitment to pushing enrichment forward building it in and and having opportunities to add more in later as well that's the other thing like some people have enrichment built into their exhibits and then they go well that's great you know we've ticked that box 
but again obviously that's just from my point of view the beginning that's the start that's your baseline enrichment and then obviously you want to build on top of that as well so so really taking that forward I think there's a lot of exciting stuff that, that technology can help us with. You know, when you look back at some of the stuff that's been done, you know, anyone who's interested in enrichment and its history, you should really, if you don't know who Hal Markowitz is, you need to go and read some of his papers and some of his books because, you know, some of the stuff that he was doing back in the 80s and then has never kind of been seen again since is, you know, I think that's a real shame that some of that information has been lost. There's a lot of very cool stuff that's just happened as a one-off and then it's never been repeated. So I'd like to see us learning from our past and developing that in our future. Yeah, one way to do that, I think, is the Shape website progresses. There's a huge backlog, catalog of, of enrichment ideas that's available from that resource, isn't there, Mark? Yes, that's right. And that is actually available at the moment. So that that is available. And actually right now it's freely available as well. So you have to register to be on the website. But once you are registered, you have free access to the, the database. And I don't actually know how many items are on there at the moment. But at last count, it was it was over 300. And it's fully searchable by taxonomic group or goal or, or whatever else that you're you're looking at. So yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great resource. And the other thing is also the safety database, which is also accessible on the SHAPE website, because safety is also a, a major limiting factor to enrichment programs. If, if people have accidents, which, you know, we've got to be honest, they do sometimes happen. People make mistakes and animals do unpredictable things. But again, on the safety database, there's a lot of lessons on there that people can learn so that they don't make those mistakes. And so that in the future, they're, they're not limited in what they can do. It's always the worst thing when you go to a place and you're like, oh, we can't use any rope because 25 years ago, an animal died from hanging itself on rope, which is, you know, that is a that is a, is a real risk. And it's something that's got to be taken seriously. But that doesn't mean that the zoo can't use rope again for the next 25 years, if if that makes sense. It's it's a lesson that we can learn from and we, we do everything that we can to make sure it never happens again by using rope in a, in a safer way or in a different way. So, yeah, both of those resources are, are, are still available despite the, the website issues. Fantastic. And we'll link all of the stuff in the podcast right up. Such great vision, Mark. We are working really hard, all of us, to make these things move faster, transpire faster as we move forward over the coming years. As mentioned, that it does sadly bring us to the end. But before we wrap up, Mark, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening to this podcast, thank you again so much for taking time to come on the show today. P- puzzle feed is full of gratitude, Mark. It's really appreciated. No worries at all. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Fantastic. And we additionally appreciate all of you tuning in today. And I want to ask a small favor of those listening. If you did enjoy this episode and you do enjoy this podcast show, as a practitioner of best practice behavior management yourself, you feel that the information held within could help others, then please share this episode wherever you can. On Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, whatever you use, so that as a community, we can do absolutely everything within our power to disseminate this information as far and as wide as possible. As mentioned, one really easy way to do this, if you're listening to it from a podcast app on your mobile device or smartphone, is there should be three little dots next to the title of this episode. This might change slightly between devices, depending upon apps but if you click on this there'll be an option to share and you can choose whatever network you want to share it in email as well and it's done really simple take you 30 seconds if you could do that that would be super that's it for this episode though we'll wrap it up there thanks again so much for listening so long king kong you'll hear from us again soon